Thanks for joining me. This is Kevin Kaplan again from the Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Team at the Children's Resource Center in Bowling Green, Ohio. This is a recorded version of the teacher chat, and this is a way that we're trying to support teachers during this challenging time. The topic of this teacher chat was alternatives to saying no. And when I thought of doing this topic, what I was really thinking about is that those two letters, N-O, don't really necessarily teach children anything. And that not that no, saying no is harmful or is gonna hurt children or that we shouldn't say it at all, not suggesting that, but that it really doesn't teach anything. And so when we think of discipline, sometimes we mix it up with punishment and discipline's really about teaching. It doesn't have anything to do with punishment. And so there are times in through our day in the classroom where we can use alternatives to say no, say no less. And along with no, I mean, it, it's really just communicating in that moment for the child to stop. And along with no, stop doesn't really teach them anything. Don't doesn't teach them anything. Quit doesn't teach them anything. And while there are times we certainly do need to use those and maybe we don't have enough time to go through all the motions with them, there are times where we can. And we'll talk about that a little bit more because if we can help children understand why what they're doing, why we want them to stop what they're doing, or maybe help them make a better choice or help them problem solve on their own what to do, figure out alternatives on their own, we'll find ourselves having to say, no, don't stop and quit less often. So thanks for joining me and exploring this topic a little bit and thinking about things. So at the basis of all this, why do we say no? Well, adults are busy. Teachers are so busy. They have so much on their hands. And behavior is frustrating. How many times do you have to repeat things? How many times do you have to go over the rules? How many times do you have to take the, spend specific time with one challenging child or two challenging children or specific challenging events or transitions. So frustrating. Children repeat things and that can be frustrating, especially like I said, when we've told them over and over and they test the limits. They push a little bit more. They, they do that same thing that we, we know they know not to do that, right? And we know and understand the reasons, but I mean, do they? You know, we know why we don't want them to have something, why we want them to stop and listen, why we just want them to act right, why we need them to quit doing something. We know those reasons, but again, do they? So why do they do that? In a nutshell, simplifying it in basic in a basic way, because adults are so busy, you know, children just have a natural need for our attention. And aside from that, their brains are still growing. And that when that behavior is so frustrating, we have to remember that behavior is communicating a need. And that need can usually fall into two categories, and that's to obtain or avoid something altogether. So attention falls in there, right? Because maybe they're trying to obtain attention. It can also be an avoidance strategy. But this is also an opportunity to build their skill. And when we take, when we have time to take a little bit to help them build their skill, that increases the connection with us. So it's kind of like we're getting a bonus because children who have a stronger connection with their teacher are going to comply more with teacher instructions and teacher commands. Children repeat things. 
And this is because of several reasons, but you can think of it as though the brain is still developing and still building. And so just as though if you started a new job, you wouldn't be able to do it perfectly the first few weeks. That's why there's a training period. And even after that training period, you're still learning and learning and learning, right? Well, I mean, children, their brains are, you know, still developing so much and there's so much going on for them that we, we can't expect them to know how to do things that adults can sometimes not do or that adults struggle with just as much. It's frustrating because we want to see them successful. We want to see them succeed. We want to have a successful classroom and we want children to learn. And that's what they're doing. And so repeating things is one way for them to practice, to get that experience in their mind. And it's also a way to get attention, which as you probably know by now, or have witnessed, children need attention. And if they, if we don't give it to them in some planned or intentional way, they will find a way to get it. And children, are good at testing the limits. And I might even reframe that from test to explore the limits because we experience it as adults as a test on our side of the fence. But on their side of the fence, they're exploring. They're trying to understand their world and make sense of it. I might think of it as just as though when you buy a car, you want to test it out. You want to explore it, inspect it, maybe a new place to live. And you have to kind of get a feel for that before you really get comfortable, right? Kind of want to know where the walls are, where the boundaries are before you can settle in. Children are doing the same thing in their environment, especially even more so when there's a new environment, a new teacher, a new adult in the room, new children in the room. When those changes happen, the boundaries kind of shift. And so we have to explore that again and learn more about that. So what can you do? Well, with adults being so busy, it can be really helpful. Okay, so let me say this first. Um, there are two types of strategies that you could use in these scenarios in the, through these challenges. And the first type that I'm gonna share with you today is like in the moment strategies. The other type is long-term strategies, strategies that you can put in place to help in the long-term. And if you're already doing these, great. I, you know, pat yourself on the back. Think about the ones you're already doing and how you might be able to improve on them or do them more. But with adults being so busy, having a schedule or routine set to establish regularity and predictability, include um, opportunities to connect and bond with them, like with how, how in hello and goodbye rituals. And those are just ways to greet or say goodbye in a fun and enjoyable way for the adult and the child. But having the schedule and routine to set that regularity and predictability helps children understand what's going to come next, what's going to happen next. And initially when we start doing that, it might be difficult for kiddos to follow that. And so some of them, we may need to take them to the schedule on the wall, the visual schedule and show them like what's happening next. Or we might need to do an, a schedule activity during circle time and just talk about parts of the schedule. And then using first then statements as the day progresses. First, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this. With that behavior being so frustrating, children really need us to stay calm. And then we can use our assertive language. Notice without judging, give them prompts, or offer choices. And we'll talk a little bit more about these tips. Children repeat behaviors. And so one way that we can reduce that 
is by offering them visual support. And the youngest of children communicate, their brains think through visuals and images. And so if we can offer them an extra way to remember and support them in following the rules, we should really do that. And so hanging up a visual schedule or visual reminders of the rules, it could be the rules for the classroom, it could be also rules for a specific toy or a play area, a certain center. It could also be visuals for problem solving. There's lots of ways to use visuals to support children in being successful. And when children test the limits, it's really important for us to remember that they're just exploring and that we need to be consistent with those limits. If you have a co-teacher or a, a support aid, teacher's aid in the classroom, talk with them. When you have time, just say, hey, this is maybe if they're new or great if you already know them and you have an established relationship. If not, you might want to say, you know, hey, this is what I think we should um, be doing. What do you think about that? Or, hey, let's set some ground rules or let's establish what, let's make sure we're on the same page, basically. And hey, you know, if, maybe if you don't have an established relationship with this other person, maybe you can pull your administrator in on this, or maybe you can support, pull your supervisor in on this. So just making sure that you're on the same page. And then when you do see children following through with, with what you want them to do and that positive behavior, be sure to praise that. Praise that with specific language and just you know have some kind of positive interaction, even for a couple seconds. That can really build that relationship with that kiddo. And other children are gonna see that this child is getting attention from you for that positive behavior and they're going to most likely want to do that positive behavior too. So this kind of thing can build and really help you in the long run, thinking of it as like an investment. So in the moment, it's recommended that you offer choices. Offering children two positive choices when appropriate, the basic formula is you may blank or blank followed by asking the child to make a choice. Which will you choose? Which is better for you? I mentioned earlier, staying calm, keeping your calm. And because as we know, if you can't stay calm, if you get worked up, then there's no chance that the child is gonna calm down. Because if you're up here, the child's gonna go up here. So you need to be down here so that the child can come down to your level. So staying calm and then using assertive communication, which is offering children clear, usable information so they know what to do or say. And so that might look like put your book bag in your cubby. And that is a lot better and a lot more helpful than what are you doing? No, right? That doesn't help children understand or be successful. We can also offer alternative behaviors. And this is kind of like a three-step process. So we would first assign positive intent, such as, I like how you're sitting there with your hands on your lap, but giving a clear limit and boundary. I like how you're sitting there with your hands on your lap, but you cannot hit your neighbor. And then offer an alternative that would be acceptable the next time the situation arises. You can keep sitting there with your hands on your lap, or you can raise your hand if you have a question, or if someone's bothering you, or whatever you think the motivation for the hitting was. Because children don't act out for no reason at all. There's usually something motivating that behavior. So those are the things that you can do in the moment. In long-term support in the classroom, you would think of using daily routines in pictures and providing a large picture schedule would be great, including all parts of the day, like large group snack time, story time. 
and have this posted at eye level. So for the children down low at eye level for them so that they can see it. And at each transition, a member of the class could remove the picture of the activity that's already happened. And how great would that be? And then they would only see the ones that are coming up next. How cool is that? Picture rule cards is another one. Display your class rules and expectations in pictures. Showing two choices for acceptable behaviors and no choice with the red line through the image to symbolize that this is an unacceptable behavior. Connecting rituals is another one and creating intentional opportunities for children to build trusting relationships with caring adults. And this is by including eye contact, touch, a present adult in a playful manner. And so eye contact means you're looking at them and they're looking at you. Appropriate touch would be gentle, calm, sincere, and kind. Would not be forceful in any way or manipulative in any way. A present adult, present does, is not the same as, being, as your presence. So just being there physically does not mean you're present. Present means you're there physically and mentally and that you're focused on that child for that moment. We're not talking about five minutes or 10 minutes. We're just talking about seconds or a minute. And then having something playful, whether you're joking, kidding, smiling, mentioning something else. Those few things can create a feel good, release of feel good chemicals in the brain, which tell the child that this is a good experience. I'm safe and lots of good release. So if you can think of a time when maybe you really connected with another person and how, how well you felt after that, this is what we're trying to create. So here are some visuals to support that stuff. You can see on the left there, there's a picture schedule with pictures and words. Each one is a different color going down the line. You could remove one after it's completed. Um, and then there's another example of that for just the morning routine. Uh, which might be helpful. And then you can see circle time rules, which gives a visual. We can talk through those in circle time, maybe at the beginning of every circle time for a while. And then there's also problem solving visuals down there. And I know that particular group of problem solving visuals is from the Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning. And those are great, those are free. In fact, all these images I got off of the internet, um, which were Creative Commons images, or in other words, not copyrighted, um, according to the internet search. And then there is a visual of when I'm, what do I do when I'm upset? And then there's five choices of what to do. Something like that would be great to help support children in choosing and problem solving an alternative for when they get upset or unhappy about something or mad about something or someone takes their toy, so on and so forth. And then you have feelings visuals. So there's six little colored faces down there. And the research shows that you know it really helps children to identify their feelings that they can see an image. We can also help them identify feelings by mirroring that facial expression that they have or just maybe sometimes talking about how we feel when it's appropriate, you know? Darn lunch isn't here yet. I'm starting to wonder where it is. I'm feeling a little worried. That's an example of identifying feelings. And children learn so much from modeling. So when we're able to model appropriate behavior, we should be. That is very helpful. So Think of ways that you might be able to incorporate visuals in your classroom, as well as the strategies that I shared with you. So the takeaway from this is to really seek first to understand the behavior and how it is either to avoid or obtain. Observe without judgment what's going on. Obviously, if it, this is not a safety concern, if there's an immediate safety concern like someone is being hit or struck or in danger, 
then we don't want to sit back and observe. We need to intervene immediately. But when it's not a safety concern, we can observe without judgment. And we might even inquire or ask questions of the child about maybe what happened to them um, leading up to the behavior. And if we did that, we would want to wait and listen patiently for answers. But we need to routinely set consistent limits and rules and support those with visuals. And be specific when we're giving direction, offering choices and alternatives, and trying to focus on the positives. Because this will all help reduce the times when we need to say no, and we will also be teaching children more than what we will if we just say, no, don't stop, quit. So thanks for joining me again, and I hope you return, subscribe to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And this strategy information was taken from the Devereux Center for Resilient Children, their DECA report, and is used in infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Children, um, this is a service used to support children, teachers, and caregivers. And this presentation is not a replacement for all, or an alternative to assessment and active consultation. Please reach out to us if you're in Northwest Ohio and you're seeking consultative support. Thank you, and I hope that you have a good day.